live stream. Um, the wonderfully dynamic live stream where you get to keep me company while I sign my name thousands of times in a row. Um, I know that every, other people like go play video games and stuff to keep you entertained. Um, and I uh, write my name a bunch of times. But over and over and over, <laughs> and over again. And over again. I do appreciate you guys all coming out uh, to see me, whoever is uh, showing up. Uh, we're um, getting comments yep. from everywhere. I haven't seen YouTube yet, but it usually takes a few minutes okay. for them to, to catch up. Well, on, we'll on hope the stream, that YouTube so. is, uh, is. It says it's on online. I just um, haven't seen comments yet. For those who don't know, we need to make sure that people. Uh, we get this question a lot. What I am signing is um, the f opening pages to today, the Way of Kings Leatherbound, uh, which will be. Uh, part of the, the Kickstarter that we're doing this summer, um, the main part of it. And what happened is we found that it, when I signed the books themselves, the shipper would ship us these great books that were well packaged and beautiful, and we would have to rip out all the packaging, throw it away eat for each book because they were individually packaged, um, then open the books and sign them, and then repackage them. It was super wasteful. Um, and we decided to be a little more earth conscious and because re repackaging all the books ended up with more scratch and dents than we wanted, that I would get the first uh, 16 pages and I would sign them and then they would be sent to the printer who would bind them into the books. Uh, so this is actually called a signature, which I'm signing with my signature, confusing, but that's what this is. So if you're curious, what is Brandon signing? Wave Kings. Um, so there we are, uh, and we are going to be answering questions. Well, I'm going to be answering questions for now, and my mother is theoretically showing up at some point. Around 7, Around I think, seven. is when she's going to be getting here. Uh, so we'll expect her at 7.30, <laughs> um, and uh, she will be answering your questions about me. So uh, look forward to that. I'm uh, curious to see how it goes when the goober arrives and starts talking. Um, but until then, Adam's going to be throwing me your questions, some of which you guys prepared ahead of time and wrote uh, to us, and I'm just going to be talking. Um, the first one is from Noah Rogers. Uh, they're wondering if you can tell them something about Spook that you don't think they already know. Boy, these, which sorts, is hard. Of, these sorts of questions, I'm glad you asked one of these because these sorts of questions are really hard. Um, I get asked this, so it started becoming a thing where someone asked me this about a character, and then I answered... And then at the next book signing, I got like three more about different characters, and so I answered. And then I just started getting a flood of them. And the trick about this is, is um, it's really hard for me to dredge up facts that I haven't talked about because, you know, Mistborn has been out for almost 15 years, and people keep asking questions like this. So I often dodge questions like this. Um, something that people don't know um, is just really tough uh, to, to answer without, because number one, I've talked about it so much, so there's very few things that people don't know, so I just end up repeating myself, and then people are disappointed because they're like, oh, he said this already. It's right here in the, in the list of all the interviews. Or I have to say something that is a spoiler, which I don't want to do. Um, so I'm going to gracefully bow out of that question. Um, well, the group of it will depend on your per perception, but it is just really hard. And I, I can't answer these, what's something we don't know about X question. I'm sorry. Totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, Agbaya is hoping for some tips for amateur or beginner fantasy writers. Uh, amateur, beginner, fantasy writers. So, whew, there are so many tips. The first one would be to go look at my YouTube channel that you're already on. You probably already know about the lectures. But if you're just beginning, for most writers, it helps to understand that um, you should not stress about even the quality of your work. You should not stress about selling the work. You should not stress about whether the work is derivative or not. For most beginning writers, uh, fantasy writers in particular, you should just write to begin to figure out how it feels to get your ideas on the page. And that is so much more important than all of these other things when you're beginning. Most of us who begin first books, I'm including myself in this group because I did that, our first book 
has a couple of problems um, that you really shouldn't stress if you start to see them in yours. Uh, problem number one is your first book is often more derivative than you want it to be, meaning you are leaning more heavily on the archetypes and stories you have seen before um, uh, to tell your story. This is not something you should stress too much about in your first book. If it really bothers you, you can fix it um, later on. You can rewrite that book. You can, um, yeah, just don't stress too much about it. Again, for most of us, this is the right advice. Every bit of writing advice is the wrong advice for someone, but for most of us, um, that's how it is. And my, my first uh, book was very, very heavily um, influenced by The Wheel of Time and Dune, uh, which is funny because The Wheel of Time was heavily influenced by Dune already. Uh, that was White Sand, the version that did not get published, not the new version. Um, but um, the other thing that often happens to you is that uh, if you are like most of us, which, you know, um, again, so, some advice is bad for everybody, but if you're like most of us, you've probably been thinking for a long time about this book that you want to write. A lot of newer fantasy writers have this, like, this opus that they begin to imagine as they read other fantasy works. Um, and they it usually starts when you're a teenager. Um, a young teen progresses all through your teenage years and into your college years where you continually are building and refining this huge, majestic, wonderful story that by the time you sit down to write it, you find out that it has been in your head through, through so many stages of your life that it is impossible to capture this book on the page because the book is no longer one thing in your head. Um, it is, it both carries the weight of the fact that you've been spending, you know, sometimes a decade or more thinking about it. And so it has all these expectations that you've built up for it. But it also is really like 12 different books trying to do 12 different things that is the greatest hits of all the best ideas you've had for all these years. And for a lot of this, our early books really sink under the weight of trying to put in all of these different things that you've been just itching to get your your world. You know, a lot of writers I meet, they've done role-playing sessions in this world. They have written some things, some histories for this world with their friends in their notebooks while they were in junior high. And they have this other thing where they came up with this character in high school. And um, this may not be the case for you, but for a lot of us, uh, this is the case, and it's okay, right? It's okay to write this book and to feel like, wow, this is just not turning out at all like I imagined it. Well, that's because it is. it has all of these other things going on with it. It's still good to write. It's still good to write it. It's still okay if you write this book and it collapses under its own weight um, after, after um, writing it for a while. Don't be afraid to write it and to say, I'm getting these ideas on paper so that later on I can use them uh, in different ways. Or maybe, maybe yours will turn out to be Harry Potter, right? And all of those years of refinement in your head turned out differently for you than it does for most of us where the, it has actually made the book really focused and uh, it turns out really great in your first try. For most of us, it just does not turn out very well in our first try. And that's okay because it's not supposed to. Uh, this next question comes from Lucas, Lucas Quick. Um, they say, hey, Brandon, how do you write a big climactic moment without a major character death? I have a tendency to always default to a major character dying in order for an event to have an impact. What are some other ways writers can include pivotal moments in their stories without losing a character? Great, great question. That is a really, uh, really introspective question on your part, kind of looking at your writing. Um, I'll just give you a few. One of my favorites is having that weighty moment, instead of be a death, be a character realizing the thing that they've wanted for so long is no longer something they can have. And you can play this a lot of different ways. Um, you can play this as the character giving up what they want for what they need, where they're at acknowledging that they've been chasing the wrong goal for a long time. You can have the character give this thing up because they realize that by, you know, it's, it's the sort of when you, uh, you will reach a story where a character realizes, I deeply love this other individual, but they will never let, lo love me back. And I need to let go at this moment and walk away 
because it wouldn't be right otherwise. It's that sort of loss-filled character revelation where they give something up. It can be where the character realizes that the scope of their life has changed so much that, um, you know, this is the moment, you, you see great moments like this in a lot of heroes' journeys where the character realizes that they can no longer have their happy home life that they wanted to restore by going out on their quest. It's kind of a classic part of the hero's journey where the hero goes on the quest to kind of preserve the idyllic life um, that is threatened, but the journey changes them so much that they, when they get back, they can no longer enjoy it. And they realize, you know, this is, this is, why, this is why Frodo, at the end of Lord of the Rings, has to go away. He can't go back to the Shire. Uh, he has been changed too much. He has saved the Shire, but the Shire, he can no longer be part of the Shire. Where it's different for Sam, who can come back to the Shire. Um, and that there's a, there's a loss and a giving up of something that the character wanted, because Frodo deeply wanted to just, you know, deliver the ring to, to Elrond and then go home back to his normal happy life. By the end of the series, it's tragic that he can't do that, but it's also the right thing answer, right? And it's, there's not a character death involved with him there. I mean, you know, there are character deaths um, tangential to that, but really it's giving up something. So ask yourself that. Um, is there a way I can have a character have to give something up? Um, uh, another great one that I really like that can have a deep and poignant um, uh, sort of thing is when um, the character overcomes something that they have been struggling to overcome inside themselves for a long, long time. Um, and I love character arcs where, which realistically show a character working on something and making a legitimate uh, step in the right direction um, at the right moment. Um, we all love that. Um, it is tricky to pull off without making it seem trite that, uh, that it's happened, but in the hands of a skilled storyteller, uh, these moments, like when Han Solo returns uh, at the end of uh, Star Wars to help Luke, can be some of the best moments in storytelling um, that ever happened. And again, does not have to involve a character death, can instead involve a character change, a character transformation that has been well foreshadowed and built up to. This next one is from Roberto Gilpita. He says, since Terry Pratchett is one of your favorite writers, he says uh, Pratchett's one of his as well. Yep. Uh, did you ever think about writing something similar to him, combining fantasy and comedy genres? What special difficulties do you think there would be in writing that kind of story? Right. All right. Yeah, I can talk about this for a while because that's another very astute question. So uh, the first difficulty is that humor historically um, has real trouble selling. Uh, this is just across all all genres and all fields. Humor doesn't sell very well. Uh, Pratchett, for instance, never reached the sales in America that he deserved. And everyone kept thinking, this guy should be selling. Like, this should be selling um, Harry Potter numbers. This is brilliant. Uh, the people get into it, really get into it. Um, and yet... It never did. It sold well, don't get me wrong, and in the UK it really sold well, but in the US it just never did. Um, and it's very hard to find any truly humorous um, science fiction and fantasy and across most genres uh, other than nonfiction. Nonfiction humor can sell real well. Um, that just does very well. And this, I don't know why this is. Um, I think it has uh, some public perception sort of things. Um, one of the reasons might be this thing I've talked about before, but this is me armchairing it. I could be wrong. Um, I feel that one of the dividing lines between Pratchett and uh, between Douglas Adams, who is another genius and wonderful writer, is that Pratchett managed to imbue his humor with characters you cared about a bit more uh, because uh, he managed to make it n the farce not extend to the characters in some way, which is the real genius of Pratchett. And he managed to have uh, plots that were not nonsensical, that, that were pretty solid uh, plots in a lot of the stories, murder mysteries or things like this, that somehow his voice did not undermine. And the big challenge in humor is, and this has happened to me um, when I have tried to write humor, is that the 
satirical and funny nature of the story completely undermines the drama and the, the tension of the pacing of the story. And you either end up going in a Douglas Adams direction, which is brilliant, but doesn't have those hooks that will pull um, a lot of audiences through a story. What I often say about Adams is I find that a lot of people will read several chapters of Adams and love it and laugh and then put the book down and then forget about the book for a while. They'll quote it, but they won't pick it back up because it doesn't have those normal narrative threads of what will happen next, uh, what's gonna happen to this character to get people to pick it up. And I found in my own work, um, when I've tried to do too much hum humor, that's one of the problems I run into. Um, the other thing is that uh, to be on the level of a Pratchett um, or a, um, or Shakespeare is really good at this too, um, your humor can't just be poking fun at things. Your humor has to be making people think and laugh at themselves as well. Um, now there's lots of great humor that just is poking fun of people, but the books that really work and why I think Pratchett works is he has this thing that it makes you feel like he's putting his arm around your shoulder and saying, aren't we funny the way we are? Isn't this funny? And you're like, yeah, this is hilarious the way we are. Um, I'm laughing at it and I understand the way we are better because Pratchett has his arm around me. And because of this, um, the books work really well. Uh, a lot of humor that um, that a lot of us try, myself included, kind of falls into um, the early Discworld books were like this. They're parodies rather than satires. And I'm not sure if my terminology is accurate to the dictionary definition, but I will make the distinction just right now that satire is this sort of laughing at the human condition and using fantasy characters and models as a way to help us laugh at ourselves in a way that, you know, makes us want to be better. Uh, whereas parody is stuff like Scary Movie, um, where it's the reference is the joke, um, which can get a few quick yucks, but is not enduring. Um, you know, look at, we made something that's silly, like this other thing is serious, but ours is silly. It can, it can be funny. But that's not what Pratchett does. And when people mistake Pratchett, that's what they think Pratchett's going to be. He, you think you're going to read the scary movie version of, um, of a fantasy book. Um, and it's kind of sad that, that even in movies it's gone that way because a lot of the, the originals, like I love Police Squad. If you guys haven't seen Police Squad, the TV episodes that became The Naked Gun, um, by Zucker Zucker Abrams, I think, or Abrams Abrams Zucker, the group that did Airplane and, um, and all of them, um, they had these, uh, these, these comedies that did go the Douglas Adams direction, but the way they could play it kind of serious just gave it some other dimension. And those episodes, which are just, you can find them on YouTube, are just so much fun. Um, and lots of density of different types of humor. Uh, that really, really work. And I feel like it's hard to do that too. Uh, Douglas Adams was like that. He would just, he would, instead of doing the character drama and um, as much, or the plots as much, he would just laden things down with such, so many jokes um, that it was just uproarious. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm wandering a little bit. The dangers are, are twofold. One is that it's a tough sell. Separate to it being a tough sell, though perhaps part of why it is a tough sell, is that parody tends to be less enduring than what I'm defining as, as satire about the human condition. And satire about the human condition is really hard to write without undermining your story. Um, and that's why we see it happening so infrequently. Um, and uh, it takes a very special wit to be able to do that, I think. Oh, this next one is from Paleo. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to know what's your opinion on the term Cytoverse for the Skyward universe. They were, oh, I like they were that. hoping to have a dedicated term for it. And I thought that was a pretty good one. I'll go with it. Thumbs up, Cytoverse. Uh, I'm on board. Uh, good job. Um, I, can, I can totally buy that. Cytoverse books one and two. I think it has a good, yeah, a yeah. good ring to it. Yeah, that's great. Um, Alexander wants to know who would win in a fight, Sadius or Amaram? Sadius or Amaram? Ah, uh, okay. Um, do we want to get this table brought in closer? Sadius 
Zadius or Amaranth? I'm glad that this one's given me some time to think about it as I move these pieces of paper across the room. Um, I am going to say Sadius at his prime. Um, and this is because Sadius at his prime was more aware of his weaknesses than Amaram was, if that makes sense. Um, and Sadius was m more aware of um, more aware of his strength and his weaknesses. Um, where Sadius runs into problem is Sadius did not have the help and the the sort of beginnings of Cosmere awareness that Amaran had. Amaran had access to way more resources um, and way more. Um, he just, he was in a better position than Sadius was uh, because of the allies and friends he had. Uh, Sadius's vision was too myopic in the series, um, uh, while Amaram's vision is too, was too, was, was bigger, but he himself did not have quite the capacity. How about that? That works. Um, Ari Nesselbaum. Um, says, I've heard it said that fiction reveals more about an author than an autobiography. Hmm. Do you agree with that sentiment? Um, I'm not sure if I can say it reveals more than an autobiography, um, but I could get on board with the idea of it, it reveals as much, just kind of different things. Um, I do think that being a fiction writer, so you have to, you have to be careful which things about the author you decide that you want to pick out. Um, because it's not necessarily the character, um, the character's given beliefs, at least in my stories, that will uh, clue you into who I am. But the things I am fascinated by, as um, indicated by multiple characters having multiple takes on this one topic, is gonna tell you a whole bunch about me. Um, I do think that by reading my books, you you get a pretty good idea of who I am. Um, I, I feel like, um, at least for me, um, it's all there on the page. And I am better writing about my life through story than I am at autobiography. But I can imagine there are other writers who are stronger at nonfiction um, than I am that would indeed write autobiographies that would be uh, equally or more telling. But yeah, I, if you read my books and you say, huh, I wonder if Brandon's like this, there's a decent chance you'll be right as long as you're looking at the themes um, that I'm playing with rather than the conclusions of any one given character. Uh, Tony Irene is wondering if you can talk a little bit about the inspiration of Wayne and if that was perhaps based off someone you know. So Wayne, where did Wayne come from? Um, so uh, the fun story about Wayne, if you haven't heard it, is I tried writing the the beginnings of L.A. of Law were a short story that I wrote where Wayne was the protagonist um, and uh, Milan was his trusty steed um, in a horse's body. Um, and uh, it was a guy who put on different hats to change personalities, um, riding to a small town of the roughs, talking to his horse, who then at the end of the first scene talked back uh, to him. Um, it was a fun scene. It was way too weird. Um, uh, after I finished that scene, I'm like, this guy is great, um, but this guy needs someone else to play off of, and it can't be his talking horse because this story is just too out there. Um, where did I, why did I start writing that story? Well, the, the initial idea is a person who changed personalities based on hats. You put on the hat and it let you kind of have a focus for your, your acting uh, to, to get into a role and become someone. That was really fun to me. In fact, in the original story, he was a hat maker. Um, he was a haberdasher um, and uh, kind of understood about people the way that they uh, buy the headgear that they like, which if I'm going to be honest and trace it back, probably goes back to Thrawn. 
Um, I love Thrawn from the uh, original Star Wars books by Timothy Zahn. Uh, and Thrawn was somebody who would look at the arts that a culture produces and use that to get come to understand them, actually it relates to the last question, um, in ways that he could then use to conquer them, which was just also always so cool to me. Um, like that's a, that's just one of the coolest villain concepts, um, is this art appreciation villain, um, who really gets to know a culture by studying their art and then crushes them and dominates them. Um, uh, just, just wonderful. Um, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a tragedy that, uh, that we didn't get, uh, Thrawn series as our, our new Star Wars movies. Um, but, um... Probably that. I'm always kind of looking for characters who see the world in an interesting way. Um, and uh, that's probably it. I don't think I was thinking that when I came up with Wayne. Um, but then Wayne needed someone to bounce off against, right? Uh, Wayne, needed, uh, Wayne needed a straight man, so to speak. Um, and uh, he would just wasn't working. Um, and so that's when I started plotting Alloy of Law, the actual novel. Uh, the short story did not become the novel. The short story taught me that there was enough there that I was interested in, that I really wanted to tell a story in this era. And it told me that there's something about this character that's going to work if I can find the right vehicle to, uh, to include them in a story. And so, yeah, uh, that's our origins of Wayne. And um, uh, I, I think I could probably also look at the Sherlock Holmes uh, dynamic, Sherlock and Watson. Anytime I'm building a mystery duo or team, there's a bit of Sherlock and Watson going around in the back of my head. Um, and um, so, there you go. Um, <clears throat> this next one is from Natalie, Nat Natalia Gula, if I can talk. Um, they say, I was wondering if you have any personal experience with loved ones dealing with addiction. Uh, the way you described Teft was heart-wrenching and on point. It helped me do to better understand the mindset of a loved one who struggles with this. Um, so I haven't had it, uh, people nearly on the level of this. Um, I have to actually thank some of my beta readers uh, for Teft. I knew these were going to be some tough scenes to do right. And I wrote them, and we actually went to uh, someone we know, um, who is, was very helpful, um, who was dealing with things very similar to Teft and had gotten into some serious trouble because of it. Um, and uh, they were able to nudge me. And this is, this is generally how I try to approach uh, touching on things like this is do what I can because I do know some people who have had some issues here, not nearly on this level. And then I look for somebody who really knows what they're talking about. And I go to them and I say, all right, give it to me. Tell me what I'm doing right and wrong. And we had a wonderful beta reader that I'm not going to mention by name because I can't remember if they wanted to be mentioned by name or not, um, who, uh, who really helped us out uh, on this one. So uh, if that person is watching, uh, you can see that, uh, that your help has been well appreciated, uh, not just by me. Um, several people have inquired about your shirt. Oh, yeah. Uh, and others are inquiring about general... Cytoverse merchandise. So I love this shirt. Uh, we have this one for sale, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is our this is our Skyward. Uh, this one is our Star Sight shirt, basically. Um, so yeah. Um, so where do our shirts come from? Um, this is this is the team. Um, basically, Kara and Isaac head the team where they come up with ideas. They show them to me. Uh, we just had two two new shirts we're working on that are very cool. Um, and uh, I. Uh, give them feedback and then we go with it. The other one we have is the, we have the Doom Slug shirt. Is that why you brought this over? Because people asked about the shirt. Oh, yeah. So we have our Doom Slug shirt. Um, I know that in the books, Doom Slug doesn't have eyes. But we got a version with eyes and a version without eyes. And, um, just looks so much better with eyes. So, uh, Maybe so, a little creepy without eyes. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, we, when the cartoon version, Doom Slug has eyes. I actually think I'm wearing my... <laughs> I'm wearing my uh, my Cosmere socks right now because they're so comfy. Um, and I also do tend to tr wear my own merch a lot of times when I go on live streams. Not to try to shill it, though I do like our merch. Um, I've had problems before where I wear certain other merch and things like that. Um, and uh, like 
I was doing recording for like the Wheel of Time B-roll stuff with interviews and things. And like, ah, oh, you can't wear that shirt because we can't get approvals to put that shirt on. But I'm like, it's official licensed merchandise. They're like, we know, but then there's all these copyright things where they're like, are you using our merchandise to sell your thing? And so I had to go, I think I was just wearing like a Nintendo Mario shirt um, um, and they had me go change. And so I've learned, you know what? I'm probably safer wearing my merch most of the time. I can't help it sometimes um, when I'm uh, wearing my Dark Souls shirt or my Magic shirts or things like that. But um, sometimes I, I think of it and I'm like, I should probably just wear our merch. So that there are no problems or questions about any of these sorts of things. Um, so yeah, but yeah, you can get this stuff all on our store. Um, and the team does a great job. Um, they're, they're really cool. Um, and they're all... Uh, here, six feet away from one another and six feet away from me, except you two, except the teenagers. <laughs> you guys are around each other so often that I don't know if it counts. Um, but um, they, uh, they are really, uh, really good folks. So hopefully you have good interactions with them um, when, you are, uh, when you're emailing them. Do you want to come on, uh, on for a sec, Mem, and stay and wave hi, or do you not want to? Yo, she got a panic <laughs> look in her eye. All right, we won't have Mem come on. Um, so, Mem is the, the person you're most likely going to be talking to if you are emailing store at brandonsanderson.com. Uh, this next one is from Ken Fagan. Um, they say, you mentioned in a previous stream that you envision the three Arrow One books as a movie, TV series, and another movie, respectively. Do yeah. you have an idea for what subsequent Arrows would look like in another medium? Yeah, so Wax and Wayne is a television show, right? Um... Straight up, that's how I envisioned it. I've only started to think of Era 1 as movie, television show movie, as I've worked on the screenplay and seen that, uh, uh, that the second book, pacing-wise, works so much better as a television show. Um, and so that's what I've started to envision that. Um, I've always envisioned Wax and Wayne as, as a television show. Um, Era 3, I have to write. I have to see how Era 3 turns out. Um, as I've told you before, um, I envision them as Mistborn spy thrillers. Um, Mistborn, you know, Tom Clancy, Mistborn, Mission Impossible kind of mashup sort of things. Um, and so they're probably going to be paced and plotted more cinematically, uh, which would, would mean features. Um, I know a lot of people talk about uh, animation, and that's totally on our radar for some of these things. There's cool things happening in animation uh, right now. I actually... Um, was talking to my people and saying, do you think we could get anyone on board for the idea of a Reckoners animated show? Um, because I think that would be awesome. Um, and uh, so it's totally on our radar. It's things we're thinking about doing. Um, and uh, I imagine it will happen for some of our properties going forward. Um, it just is, which, what is the right one? and what is the right medium and things like that. A lot of people ask me about video games. We tried for years on Mistborn uh, with a really great uh, group of people who I still really like. Um, Little Orbit um, and Matt Scott, just top-notch folks. They, uh, they treated me great, they treated the property great, um, but it just didn't come together. Video games are such a hard world. Like. I know, you know, I hang out with, uh, with the Fortnite folks uh, quite a bit because they, um, Epic Games has a studio in Salt Lake and I uh, worked with the director of Fortnite on the, um, the Infinity Blade books. Um, and we hang out, uh, not, na not anymore, uh, not for the last few months, but, um, you know, I, his world is so different from my world um, where I can conceive something, I can be like, all right, my whole team, I'm going to take two years, I'm going to write this thing, and then we're going to release it. And I can do that, right? Video games, it's so much harder. There's so many people you have to manage, same in films, but so many people to manage, and it feels like the whole, the whole, um, the whole thing, the whole business is in a bad place. Um, like, too many studios are overworking their people. I've known, I've had friends who work in... I do not like the things that happen in video games um, in order to get video games made and released. Really don't like um, how that is. One of the things I, reasons I like Epic is they were very not about that. Um, and um, 
Boy, it's a rough world, but then so many studios just crash and fade away and, uh, and things like this that the whole system seems so volatile um, that it, and plus the way to make money now is with loot boxes and things, right? Like microtransactions, which I'm not a big fan of. Um, I don't think they're doing good things for the video game uh, world. Let me just leave it at that. And so it comes into this, do you wanna make a video game? If so, how do you pick a company that is not going to have huge amounts of crunch time for all of their employees and ruin their family lives? How do you do that? Plus have a game that is not going to have tons of microtransactions and things like that. It is rough. Um, and so I've been building connections in the video game world with people, uh, working um, on with people, trying to look for places that I can do things <coughs> that I would feel good about the company and the, uh, the product. So that's a long-winded answer to say, I don't know when I'm going to get you video games, guys. It's a hard world out there. John Javi Cole... Um, wants to know if you can talk a little bit about why you changed Chris's personality so much between the White Sand prose and the White Sand graphic novel. Um, so I felt that the biggest weakness to a lot of my early writing, this encompasses uh, Dragonsteel, um, White Sand, and Elantris, <laughs> is that my world building was really working. My magic systems were really coming together and my characters were flat and kind of boring. Um, and um, this early work of mine, I look at, and there's a lot of external conflict to characters, and it works in Elantris, right? Raoden is a bit boring compared to some of my other characters, but he has an enormous external conflict to deal with, and that actually kind of works, right? Like. Um, there are lots of, um, of movies. Uh, I mentioned Mission Impossible earlier, right? Like, um, like uh, Tom Cruise's character in those. Not the most interesting character, but he doesn't have to be because, in fact, it would probably make the movies worse if you uh, spent a lot of time on them. Um, and uh, on that. Like, that's not what those movies are about. And so if you have lots of tension and lots of external conflict, then you can have a character who doesn't change as much, who doesn't go through uh, big character arcs and things. And it's not just fine, it's a, it's a selling point of the story. It's just a different type of story. But the problem with, with mine is they were all kind of the same person. They're all kind of the same level of boring in a lot of my early, uh, early works. And so when we approached the prose ver or the, the graphic novel version, um, one of the things I wanted to do is see if I can liven up the characters a little, if I can make them more like I would write them now. Um, and that's, that's what happened uh, with basically all the changes in White Sand um, were attempts to do that, make the story more like I write right now. And I'm, I'm pleased with those changes. The only thing I don't like about White Sand is as we were new um, into doing this, um, we did not get the world building across in a visual medium the way we wanted to. I don't think that the world building uh, made the leap and we're trying to fix that with future things that we're doing. Uh, we're hoping that we can, we can play to the strengths of graphic novels um, and not have them, yeah, lose some of the, some of the coolness. Um, some of the things that were working in the White Sand Pros didn't make the jump to the graphic novel as well as we wanted them to. Uh, S.C. Inver um, says, Brandon, did you do any research into the Knights Templar uh, when you were preparing to write about the Radiance? Uh, so, yes and no. I find the Knights Templar fascinating, and I've often read about them and been interested in them. When I was writing the Knights, coming up with the Knights Radiant, the origins of them didn't have, like, um, like even the way that I, I, I didn't even call them the Knights Radiant in the first draft um, and things like that, the first version of Way of Kings uh, and stuff like this. And so some of these connections that now seem pretty clear um, with the, the ancient order that has fallen away and it's being restored and even the titling didn't really exist in the early ones. Um, I would say they're there in the back of my brain, uh, certainly. Um, uh, and would be an unconscious influence, but a lot of things that you might say, hey, these came from the Knights Templar, didn't. 
Um, but uh, we're more of a parallel evolution sort of thing as I figured out what I wanted the Knight's Radiant to be. Um, our friend Evgeny Karolov wants you to tell something, tell them something they don't know about something they don't know. Oh. <laughs> so it's a pretty open question. <laughs> something, oh, Evgeny. Um, all right. Something they don't know about something they don't know. Um, I have written a flash fiction story. And I won't tell you very much about it, but it's like really short. It's like 500 words. Um, and um, I'm very proud of it. Um, and if we ever release a collection of non-Cosmere stories, which we want to do someday, we will put it in there. Is that the same one you wrote uh, as part of Mary Robinette's no. class? No. Oh, okay. The one I wrote with Mary Robinette's thing was terrible. <laughs> uh, this is a different one. I don't know if you've read it. I have not read um, that one. So it's, uh, yeah, uh, I, I thought it was pretty cool that I managed to do it. I don't know that it stands up against the real masters of flash fiction, but I at least can say I've done one. So, Very cool. Um, Rob Santos says... How would you recommend an aspiring writer go about learning military structures as well as how to implement it without boring readers? Okay, well, this is a, this is a two-part question. Uh, I'll ta tackle the without boring readers thing first. A uh, couple things to keep in mind here. Number one is context. What type of story are you writing? Uh, if you are writing a military science fiction story, then the things that you might think some audiences find boring other audiences, particularly those who really like military science fiction, um, they are going to feel like the story is lacking it if you don't include it. Um, uh, this is like, you know, if you're going into a big epic fantasy with, uh, with cool mythology, you're going to feel like it's weird if the mythology doesn't get explained at some point. Um, so understand that, but also understand this is the hardest part about writing science fiction and fantasy and basically anything is how to make the stuff the reader needs to know not boring so they put the book down. And this is, uh, this is your challenge, learning to write. Like this is one of the pillars uh, of, of writing fiction. Uh, being able to make a compelling character being able to tie narrative threads together in a way that's satisfying, that involves promises and payoffs, and being able to info dump in a way that is exciting rather than boring. So you're gonna have to do a lot of study on that, right? It, I don't think it's just military uh, protocol. It's, this is, this is one of the big things. I call it the grand skill of writing science fiction and fantasy. Um, and there are tons of ways to do it. Uh, there is not one way to make things exciting. Um, my class talks a lot about this, but you know, the, the voice that you use, the situation that things are presented, I mean, <clears throat> all mediums do this, and some of it do it really well, some of it do it very poorly, all, all storytelling mediums, right? Like, you know, you can go to Jurassic Park and they put a movie in that's animated about the mechanics of how they make, and you get in, the characters get in the ride and watch the Disney ride of how the mechanics of the, you know, the world building work. Um, and in other things, you have Watson getting explained the mechanics of how things are working by an expert character. Um, and other things, you make it uh, happen in the middle of an action scene. Uh, so it's really, you know, they're feeding very tersely information in a way that is really interesting and fun. Um, so that's different from how do you get this information? Military uh, stuff in particular um, is tricky because, um, so if we back up a minute and we talk about um, including expertise you don't have in your books in general, the danger of doing this is, um, is many fold, but one of which of them is that people who know more about this than you do, reading your book, the things you get wrong will weigh them on their mind so much that it can ruin the experience for them. Now, if what you're getting wrong is something um, that not a lot of people have expertise in, um, it can be less damaging to your story. For instance, 
the field medicine and way of kings. I did get an expert doctor, um, a, a field medic to, to read and tell me what I was getting wrong and things like that. Um, but if I hadn't done that, I don't think it would have killed the book for very many people uh, because even a lot of modern surgeons are not uh, out doing field medicine with, uh, with cauterizing people's wounds with knives that they have to heat up in a flame. Um, and so as long as I wasn't doing too much, I was okay. Problem, how does this relate? There are a lot of people in the military, a lot of people who have family in the military, a lot of people who love military science fiction and military fantasy um, and have experience with the military that getting some of these things wrong can kill your credibility really quickly. And beyond that, a lot of these readers have seen people get things wrong so often that they are highly skeptical of someone who doesn't have a military background writing about the military. Um, it can be done, but so many people do it poorly that they kind of rightly have a chip on their shoulder about whether you're going to get it right or not. Uh, what did I do? I read a lot. I read biographies. Um, I read experiences, and then I made sure that my writing group has someone on active duty in the military um, in the writing group reading my writing and giving me feedback from the viewpoint of a soldier because in the Stormlight Archive there are lots of soldiers and I need to make sure I'm getting these things right. Um, and I have fortunately over time picked up enough stuff um, that I very rarely get things wrong, but when I do, I have folks who will tell me. Um, so understand what you're kind of working against. This isn't a reason to not do it. In fact, I do think it is a reason to do it, but you're gonna to wanna to go to primary sources. You're gonna to wanna to do your reading. You're gonna to wanna to understand that this is one that you can't skimp on um, your knowledge. This is one that you can't fake as easily uh, because so many people uh, that are gonna be reading your story, potentially, uh, have direct experience with this. Uh, this next one's going to be very quick because okay. I know what your answer is going to be. Huh. Um, it's from Ray Game, and they want to know what your favorite breakfast cereal is. I do not eat breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you knew that. I knew um, that one, yeah. Yep. Um, I have not... I The last time that I consistently ate breakfast was when my mother made me eat breakfast in the morning before school, before I got old enough to say no. Um, the reason I do not eat breakfast is because... I am an insomniac, and uh, I struggled a lot through the early part of my life. Um, like, getting a half hour extra sleep before school was very important for me being able to pay attention in school. Um, I think it is criminal how early we make high school students get up. Do you guys agree with that? Yeah. Yes. Like... We expect high school students to be doing their best work and all of these things. And it's this very important time in their lives. And all the medical experts say, you know, in high school, you still need more like nine hours of sleep, not eight hours of sleep. Um, and yet we have these teenagers functioning on like seven a lot of times because we have to get them up so early. Um, and so anyway, regardless, I have never been a breakfast person. Um, and as soon as I was able to choose, I slept instead of breakfast. And now you might say, Brandon, why don't you just eat breakfast when you get up? I get up at 2 these days or 1.30 because, you know, normally I was getting up at noon. But then we went on this uh, quarantine thing and my family all stayed, started staying up two hours later because they didn't have school in the morning. So my kids go to bed like two hours later. My wife goes to bed two hours later. So my schedule just slipped, shifted to two hours later as well. Um, and so, um, I'm going to bed a lot of days at, uh, at six and getting up at two, um, or at five and getting up at one. And I'm just not going to go eat breakfast. Breakfast, most breakfast food, um, in America is an excuse to eat, eat desserts. Um, right. Delicious, now I will say this. Desserts. I love a good English breakfast. When I'm over in the UK, one of the delights is that my schedule is off. So I start usually getting up at like 8 a.m. because, you know, you know, the jet lag doesn't really hit me because I just keep my schedule, except I just shift to a different part of the day. Um, and I'm just so used to um, getting over insomnia and stuff that I deal really well with jet lag. And I'll just start getting up and I'll order an English breakfast. Um, these things are not healthy. But man, do they know how to do breakfast in Europe. 
Um, if I were eating French croissant or if I were eating full English breakfast, I'm sorry, guys, I don't do the blood pudding. Um, but um, uh, then maybe you would have me. Um, but uh, I don't generally love sweets. So cereal, eh, you know, like not a thing. A lot of them are sugary. Uh, when I do pick a cereal, um, I like one that is very granola-y um, and things like that, like a nice uh, granola-ish sort of thing. So what are like honey bunches of oats um, is okay. There's another one that's more granola-y um, and things like that. I'll pick those, but I, you know, like I like pancakes just fine. They're not, they're a dessert. Cake I don't, yeah, is literally cake, in the term. You're eating cake and pouring frosting on it. Um, so this is just not my thing, but uh, a big plate of eggs, bacon, and sausage uh, with hash browns. Well, you'll have me, you, you, you have my attention at that point, but it's not something that I generally want to eat right after I get up. It's just too heavy. So you want to have an egg, bacon, and sausage cereal made that you can <laughs> eat? I also don't it's drink milk. Um, oh. That's another thing. Like I like dairy just fine, but milk tastes weird to me. Mm. And I haven't really uh, had milk since I was, uh, a again, in high school when my mom was like, you need to eat this to make you grow big and strong and healthy. And I'm like, all right, I'll do that. But as an adult, I just don't drink milk. Uh, it has a weird mouthfeel to me. Mm. So... Um, Eli Moss is hoping that you can talk a little bit about your writing playlists, what kind of criteria you have, how much time you spend on it, you know, Great. things like that. So where are my writing playlists? And you can find these on uh, Spotify. Um, where do they come from? Uh, I don't know if Adam can post the links in the, um, in the description or I something after like that. We're done. After, after we're done, if you want to come back and look. Um, or maybe we'll just have them for next time or something like that. I have one for Stormlight 3, Stormlight 4, and for Skyward, right? We have three separate playlists. Uh, where do these come from? Uh, so these generally come from these days, um, the whole Spotify um, uh, Discover Weekly. Uh, because Spotify has this feature where you listen to a whole bunch of songs and the ones you like and you thumbs up, it'll start creating you playlists. And they usually make a playlist that's pretty decent for me. And usually once every week or two, a song really stands out to me. And then I stick it in a separate pr playlist. And then eventually when uh, it comes time to work on a book, I compile those uh, together. Uh, I do like to have different feels for the different books I'm writing. And you can get a feel for what they are uh, by going and you know comparing the Stormlight one to the Skyward one, for instance. I'm looking for a lot of cinematic music. Um, I'm looking for... Um, a lot of instrumental, uh, these sorts of things. I like think different things though when I work out. So sometimes these playlists get things on them that you're like, this does not seem to fit. Well, that's a good workout song, right? I've been listening before the the, the uh, quarantine happened. I was listening to Great War by Sabaton. That was my go-to uh, workout music um, uh, album for the few months leading up to the quarantine. So you can go listen to the other things, um, the other playlists, and see what it is I like when I'm writing. Um, Evgeny asked another question that I really like, so I'm going to mm. take another one from him and then add a little twist on the end. Okay. Um, he says, another author from the past or present dies and leaves a secret magical artifact to you. What <laughs> is this artifact? <laughs> Okay. And then my twist yeah. is, if you were to leave mm. a secret magical artifact, what would you choose that artifact to be? Well, if you believe the internet, it is the crystal that holds the writing power of Pat and George <laughs> that I have somehow <laughs> stolen away and siphoned. Um, there, there's, a, there's a funny comic about that. Um, so somewhere I'm keeping the souls, the writing souls of George Martin and Pat Rothfuss, and I'm apparently drawing power from this um, and feeding on it like a... You know, like you use the power, the the life force of a Gelfling to stay alive. I guess. Um, <laughs> what what artifact uh, would I want? What would they they leave behind? Hmm. I don't know. Um, um, the source of Pratchett's insight into human nature. Let's let's assume that he's somewhere got that. It's a little imp that sits on his shoulder and tells him <laughs> how humans. Uh, how humans work, or not sits on his shoulder, sits in a fake PDA and goes beep, beep, boop to him. Um, some, something, what, however Pratchett understood human beings so well, um, that I would like to, I would like to have. So cool. we'll uh, steal that. Uh, this next one from Aiden Knorr um, 
says, hey, Brandon, do you write your books with specific marketing for age groups in mind? What conscious decisions are you making on deciding what's too racy or inappropriate for what you're writing? Right. Um, so, um, there's a few guidelines I kind of keep in mind um, as I'm writing. Um, number one, it's me. So it's probably not going to be too racy. Let's just be honest. Um, the stuff that I'm like, hmm, this is too racy. Other people are like, Brandon, uh, this is PG. Um, so, you know, I, that's, pr that's not a big concern for me. Uh, more, having children, I know how my children react to romance of any sort, um, right? Like, so this is more the middle grade. Uh, if you take the imaginary, doesn't have to be strict, but dividing line between middle grade and YA. Uh, there's a couple things happening there. Um, one of which is romance becomes interesting rather than a pure negative. I showed my kids The Princess Bride um, this last week. Um, and I told them, there's a kid who voices your, you know, there's a narrator that's you. That's like, does this have kissing? Um, and they were all so excited. And at the end, my 10-year-old said, he failed us, Dad. He let the kisses still happen. Um, there were three kisses in that movie. Um, and yeah, they got interrupted, but then they still happen. Like my kids are serious, hardcore kissing ruins movies. Um, and, um, you know, having kids and knowing better about the middle grade. And I had an instinct for this, um, has, is, you know, when I write middle grade, which I rarely do. The only thing I've written middle grade is Alcatraz. Um, uh, that, that's a dividing line. The other big dividing line that I keep in mind is, uh, again, this is not strict, but generally the uh, transition between middle grade and YA is uh, the transition between being handed books by authority figures and picking books out yourself or getting them from friends. Um, and that changes a little bit as you are starting to be interested in romance. You are starting to be wondering... Um, this whole, this thing I've been dreading all along that I no longer get to be a kid and have to start learning to be an adult is happening to me right now. Ah, right? Like we've all gone through that. Um, and that is, is something I keep in mind for YA. But YA, um, there is no rule about what you can and can't include uh, content wise. Um, middle grade, it depends on your publisher, but in most cases, middle grade will be edited for content. Um, if you try to put a racy, um, romance scene in a middle grade book, everyone is going to look at you real weird. If you put it in a YA book, depending on your publisher, they might be like, yeah, great. Uh, package it and ship it. Um, if you're with like Disney, they might be like, ah, this is off brand for us. Uh, probably doesn't belong here. Um, but, uh, for me, uh, the real difference between when I'm writing adult and when I'm writing YA is why I try to keep lean and focused on a single or a couple of characters experiences as they navigate this whole, man, I have to be an adult now. That sucks. Um, and there are lots of different approaches to, to that. Um, whereas in adult, I'm usually shooting for a huge variety of different viewpoints, experiencing all across the spectrum of human experience. Um, and that's basically the difference. I do try to keep the YA a little faster pace um, um, and shorter chapter length. Um, but content wise, uh, not something that I super worry about a ton. Um, I was very happy when in Steelheart, um, I came up with there's at one point in one of the books, um, there's a character who, uh, who in real life would swear a whole ton, uh, but he's sending everything via like text and stuff. Um, and so um, I had the characters uh, add in some filters to change his swear words into really silly things, which is something I've done before to people. And so um, stuff like that is very fun for me to play with, but uh, you could just include those words if you were writing YA, uh, if you wanted to, your publisher, depending, would not uh, edit them out. This next one is from Pi Lanningham. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a two-part question. 
Um, they say, has watching the world change from coronavirus make you want to explore anything in your writing? And also, do you know how the coronavirus will impact the Rhythm of War release party? So, uh, great questions here. So I am, of course, much more interested in writing um, Silence Divine. Uh, I have had to say, no, Brandon, you can't do that right now because you are writing. This is my... Uh, this is my pandemic book, um, the book where people gain superpowers from, uh, from pandemics. Um, I'm, I'm interested in doing that. I'm really, like, if you take aside all of the pain and suffering, which is there's a lot um, because of this, it is a really fascinating social experiment that is teaching, I think, a lot of us writers a lot about human nature, uh, which is really cool and it's been really fascinating to watch. Um, you have to separate out, though, and, and acknowledge this is really hard for a lot of people um, and really stressful, and it really sucks. And I don't want to diminish that by saying, the writer says, ooh, how can I use this? But that is what we do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, it will give me more information for things that I will want to do, but it's not like anything specific is coming out of this uh, for me. Um, other than, you know, me hopefully understanding human nature just a little bit better. Uh, what was the second half of that question, Adam? Um, the Rhythm of War release party. Rhythm of party. War release party. So the big answer is we don't know. Um, so, so many things are up in the air right now. Um, like, things are getting canceled right and left, but we don't know how November is going to look. Um, and we have... Um, large financial obligations to the place that we have rented. Um, and so um, we are hoping that one of two things happens. Uh, that number, the, the number one is basically society has um, gained herd immunity by this point, which may not, you know, who knows? Um, a lot of uh, experts are saying, no, that won't happen. But we can still hope um, that it is safe to congregate um, in groups by then, by November, and that we will have it go as planned. The other thing that we are hoping is that if it is not safe, the government, the Utah legislature has mandated you can't have meetings larger than X because that would let us uh, be out of our financial obligation to this thing. Um, if that's not the case, then we're going to have some real tough decisions to make um, because uh, these, these convention halls are not cheap. Um, and you know, we're on the hook for that and maybe we will just be on the hook for it and be like, all right, we're just going to eat this money, uh, because it's just not safe. Uh, we will be in touch with you guys as it gets closer and say, what do you want to do? Um, it's really would be sad if it got canceled. Um, but you know, th these things happen. We were planning like lots of convention tiles type stuff. We had like four artists we were going to fly out. We were going to have, uh, panels all day by, uh, by fans uh, kind of uh, talking about things and then, you know, the evening big party and things like that. So that would be really fun if we could still do it. So, so uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed, but um, we'll be in touch with you guys. We'll be asking what everyone thinks. Uh, this next cr uh, question is from Kareen Kumar. Uh, and they say, do you have any advice for a strong discovery writer who has who really struggles with outlines, but wants to write something on the scale of the Stormlight Archive. Um, yeah, do understand that George Martin was a discovery writer, is a discovery writer, and wrote something on that scale um, by discovery writing it. So it, it's totally okay. Now, what I would recommend for a strong discovery writer is to understand that everyone discovery writes. I talked about this last stream. Uh, I discovery write, right? Even though I'm a, a strong outliner, it's just when we do our discovery writing, um, I do more of it up front when I'm, you know, building the outline. Uh, what I would recommend is try something that's a hybrid method before going all in on an outline. And your hybrid method is something like Robert Jordan used. Uh, he uh, used this hybrid method called the points on the map. This is where he knew where he would, the big moments he was shooting for ahead of time. He listed them all out and then he let himself discover write himself between these big moments. So his outline at the beginning for I have or for uh, for the Wheel of Time would have been like just a couple pages for the whole thing, right? Because he was going to discover write 
Um, and he just knew these tentpole moments needed to occur. Um, and I, it's often really handy to have some sort of model or guide that you are using. Uh, for instance, Robert Jordan was using Arthurian mythos, right? That's where he started from with this idea of Arthurian mythos. Um, and we're going to, um, we're going to get the, uh, uh, the carrot, the, you know, the dragon reborn is going to go to the stone that is not a stone and pull the sword that's not a sword out of the stone that's not a stone, right? Um, and he knew that sort of uh, big moment in the Arthurian mythos. He knew the Fisher King stuff from King Arthur, that the king and the land are one, and the king's health influences the land and these sorts of things, and was kind of pushing toward some of these big moments and revelations, <coughs> um, and he knew what was happening at the end. Um, and, you know, some big things along the way, um, like the cleansing and stuff like this. Uh, if you can find a good guide somewhere um, of the events that you can use kind of as a backbone to your story, um, that can be really handy. By a backbone, I'm talking about like an overarching kind of plot archetype. George used War of the Roses, right? Um, you know, he, he said, I'm going to do, I'm going to do War of the Roses and I'm going to, I'm going to flip Great Britain upside down and, uh, you know, stick Ireland on top of it or something like that. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but, um, just kind of built this idea where he's going to use real world events as a model and guide to guide him through whenever he got lost, he could say, well, what happened to the real world? All right. How does that relate to my characters? Should I do an adaptation of this? And he didn't always. Uh, but a lot of times I, I think that was a handy guide. You'd have to talk to him. Uh, I don't want to put words in his mouth. Uh, but I know with, uh, with, with Jim, with Robert Jordan, the Arthurian mythos was, was handy. Um, having something like that, being like, I'm going to use Journey to the West, right? Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to underpin my story with that so that as I, am, um, as I am discovery writing, I've got the major plot beats planned out ahead of time. And I can just discover right between them. Give that a try. Uh, this next one comes from Divine Arbalest. Um, they say, can you go more in depth on how a soft magic system can work without being do sex machina? Yeah. Deus oh. sex machina. Yeah. Yes. I, knew, I know there's another way to pronounce there it. it I, all I know is it means hand of God, I think. Uh, God from the machine. Oh, God from the machine. Um, yep. Um, I believe that you'd have to, you'd have to actually, I, I'm not good on ancient languages, but um, so, so let's ask ourselves why do we dislike a deus ex machina why is it unsatisfying um and then think about how we can avoid those pitfalls that's where i would kind of start and say all right i don't want to do a deus ex machina what is a deus ex machina why doesn't it work it is when the characters are saved at the end of the story because of things they didn't necessarily do or earn and so it is not a satisfying resolution because our characters didn't earn it. Now, there is nothing in what I just said there that precludes a soft magic system from working or even being the solution at the end of the story. Um, you just have to have the characters earn it. And now a hard magic system, often the way the characters earn it is by coming to understand the magic and learning to apply it. But um, I often, in my class, I use the example of uh, the second Lord of the Rings film where Gandalf is very much a soft magic in those, um, those movies. You don't know what Gandalf can do. Um, often his magic is represented by light doing something. And in the end of that movie, Gandalf saves them. He shows up with an army and saves them. Ask yourself, how did they earn that? Well, they earned it by Gandalf with the soft magic saying, if you live three days, I will save you at the end. The characters struggle. They work hard. They, you know, and they accomplish what they needed to do in order to earn Gandalf's salvation. So if you want to use your magic at the end to save the people, make sure it's set up in, in, in a way that it can happen. Now, that's only one way that you could use soft magic like this. If you wanted a very soft magic system um, where, you know, your soft magic can save the day, it can do anything, but you can't choose the consequences, you can make it 
that the consequences are so dire that they weren't worth the salvation that you earned at the end. And suddenly it's caused all sorts of larger and bigger problems, right? Um, this is, um, and, and you have to be, you are balancing how soft your magic is, how hard your magic is. Don't mistake internal logic for a hard magic or an external logic for a hard magic. Watch my lecture on that. I get into it deeply, um, but it is a mistake you can mean, you can, um, you can, you can make where you are saying, a soft magic system is one that's unexplained. Well, yes, but a soft magic system is usually, I would define it as, the reader does not necessarily know what will happen when the magic is used. And play with that. Uh, we have my mother here, so uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna have her come. Um, uh, and so, uh, I didn't see you come in there. Um, so I've already, uh, I've called them, I've called you Goober before them, oh, no. uh, multiple times. I, I apologize, You're in trouble. but, uh, that is, that is who you are, is you are the Goober. Um, uh, everyone, this is my mother, uh, Barb Sanderson. Um, and, uh, you have heard me talk about her quite a bit. Um, and she is a wonderful person who came out to visit us. Um, and so she agreed to uh, be on the uh, on the stream last week. My dad was on the stream, and were you watching? You I see was you're watching. watching. Yeah. You, you saw all the stories. I all did. the they, stories. They grow bigger every time you mm -hmm. tell them. <laughs> um, so uh, my mom's from Idaho Falls. Yes. Um, I did not grow up in Idaho Falls. I grew up in Nebraska, um, but my parents moved back to Idaho Falls um, when I was in college, um, and so um, my sisters were both raised in Idaho Falls. We should have the, we should have Jane on at some point. Jane is Adam's wife. Uh, she'd have stories. Yeah, yeah. So does Lauren. Yeah, Lauren would have the, the, one, the weird one. Right? She would have. Yeah, she would have. She would have more embarrassing stories. By the way, she's very offended that you called her the weirdest one. Yes. What, what Lauren is? Yeah, she says you're the weirdest one. Lauren is absolutely the weirdest one. Um, if we took a vote in family, I don't think it would even be close. Um, so, uh, if you guys have questions for my mother... We already have a um, bunch. Yeah. Star, start asking. Uh, this one is from Sarka Slobodova. I'm sure I did wonders on that name. Uh, they say, first off, happy late Mother's Day. Uh, and they want to know how Brandon, was, how Brandon was as a child. Did you notice his storytelling qualities early on? And do you have any good stories about Brandon that you can share with everyone? Yeah, but when Brandon was when Brandon was really uh, young, he liked to he had favorite characters. These were mostly from well maybe books we'd read you, but from TV. And he would dress up as he thought they would dress, and then he wouldn't answer me if I didn't know if I didn't call him by the name. So if he was Superman, then if I didn't call him Superman, he didn't talk to me. And you go around all day like that, and the next day be somebody different. So uh, I, I knew. You've said it was hard to guess sometimes. It was very hard to guess because it, you didn't in the, in those days you didn't ha couldn't go to the Disney store and buy the outfit. You put them together, and so he would put it together thinking that he looked just like this character, and I wouldn't know who he was. And then I'd wander around, and you'd be like Brandon, and I wouldn't respond. No, you'd be like Superman didn't respond. Wouldn't yeah. talk to me all day. Mm -hmm. I did not find out who he was. It was it was pretty fun. <laughs> and so I, I do have one funny story that uh, when Brandon was older. Um, <laughs> I'm curious what this will be. Oh no, this is a good one. Okay. Um, Brandon always got good grades and Jordans were quite good. I love and, this story. Yeah. But, but on the good side as well. Jordan and, is my brother who's two years younger than me. Yes. And uh, they decided they had a computer, and they decided that they were going to fool their mom, so they both changed their report cards. And I was really into report cards. I mean, you know, they had to get good grades. And they changed them all to Ds and Cs and Fs. And I had to actually... We can move this over for her. Well, she's just looking this way. Oh, okay. So okay. I had to actually uh, go to the school to find out their grades. We, were, we did a really good job of you this. Did. because. Photoshop, people didn't know about back then. You have to understand, this is the 90s. Nobody knew you could do this sort of stuff. Um, and we just had some computer classes and Jordan got access to a scanner, which is, we, like, you, this is the first time scanners existed, right? Yeah. 
And so we're like, what can we do with this? And so we intercepted our, our report cards, which I think they mailed to you. Yeah. Um, and we got them out of the mail. We scanned them. We changed the numbers to worse grades. We put them back in the envelopes and put them back in the, um, in the, uh, the mailbox. And the funny thing is, um, we changed all of ours to D's and F's. And then Jordan looked at me and he said, she'll never believe you got F's. She'll believe I got F's. She won't believe you got F's. You need to change yours to B's and C's. And so we did um, uh, and gave him all F's. Um, so, and then and I still came unglued. <laughs> you came completely unglued. It was, it, we maybe sometimes go a little far in pranking our mother. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. No, absolutely. Never. Maybe <laughs> once in a while. Um, um, we, uh, because my mother is strict, but in the good way, right? Like she's someone you can tease. She just has high expectations, right? Like I can imagine some mothers that could not be teased that way. Um, um, and I can imagine other mothers who just wouldn't care. Mm -hmm. And you're like this perfect mix of that you will absolutely care so we can prank you good. But we also know it won't, uh, it won't ruin her relationship. Uh, and so we, we may be, we may be on occasion, um, we're, we're a little bit, uh, we, I might have shown up one time with a girlfriend at my mom's house that she didn't know I'd been dating for four months and just showed up and said, hey, look what followed me. It's a girl. <laughs> yes. When you're in college. Yes. When I'm in college. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you uh -huh. did that I did sure. that. Yes. We may have shown up to family pictures with giant mustaches and beards. Oh, yes. That's a good story. <laughs> I don't, I don't ever get family pictures. I just, I, I think the last time I did, we had only half of you married yeah. and mm -hmm. two grandchildren. Now we've got uh, five grandchildren. And so I just, you know, finally Lauren was getting married. She's the youngest daughter. And so we decided since everybody would be there and be dressed that we would um, take family pictures. And Jordan and Brandon showed up in full bears. It was awesome. <laughs> That picture, like we never have facial hair, Jordan and I. No. But for that one, we showed up with full beards, full beards. and Not they were we'd grown them out really for six months. I'm yeah. hoping that we can uh, post some of those sometimes because yeah, you, you grow them pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we need to, uh, we will, we, we can post those, that, that picture though. She has not forgiven us for that one. We went a little far on that one. Uh, we need to get you some real family pictures. Um, you do. But you we grew them partially for various reasons, but one was for Lauren's wedding. And we've been going for like four months when you decided we we're going to do family pictures because we were doing this okay. partially to prank Lauren and we're like, great. Now we either have to cut these off and go six more months afterward, or we just show up for family pictures and beards. And then lo and behold, we showed up. And yeah, and what, it's not a good combination when you put Jordan and Brandon together because yes. what one doesn't think of, the other does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, this next question, I'm pretty sure, comes from the worst person on the planet. Oh, um, she Kathy. says, <laughs> "Who is your favorite child, and why is it Jordan?" Oh. <laughs> 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 that, that's our Kathy. <laughs> uh, Kathy is Jordan's wife. Yes. Yes. And yes. I'm accurate in saying she's the worst person ever. Mm. <laughs> we love her. She had to sing to my bird today because he was being very loud and I needed to do phone calls. And so she had to sit up and sing songs to him. And he tries to sing along. <laughs> she has a good voice. She does. She has a beautiful yeah. voice. Oh, we shouldn't say that. She's watching. She oh, has no. an awful voice. She she's terrible. Voice. <laughs> um, another question from Ray Game um, says, when did you lose control over your son not eating breakfast? <laughs> Well, I hate to tell you this, but... It was almost a good spit take right there. He learned it from me. Mm. <laughs> we kind of have the same habits. Yeah. And, uh, sleep, you know, I stay up until 2 or 3 in the morning, and I uh, don't necessarily always eat breakfast. And so he, This he is why the goober food. failed several of these things, is because I am very like her in a lot of ways. And, um, yeah, the, like, you would be like, go to bed. I'm like, why are you awake? <laughs> She, she would be like, you have to get up for school. I'm like, you go to work before I go to school. 
why are you awake? And um, yeah. Probably yeah. mopping the floor and cleaning the floorboards. Yeah. I, was, mm. well, I was cleaning up after these boys. Oh, sure. <laughs> she was. We were, we were not the cleanest uh, in the world. Uh, so, yeah. But yeah, and you didn't eat breakfast. You had always fed me breakfast when I was young enough. Yeah. To, but when I got into high school and I just was not getting enough sleep, yeah. like it was seriously, my mother is a saint for getting me up because those mornings, um, I look back and I'm like, I, like, I just did not want to get out of bed, uh, at 6 AM. And, you know, I would have gone to bed at two in the morning. Um, and this isn't entirely like, I legitimately have troubles going to sleep earlier than that. Um, but she got me up every day and, uh, I did not fail out of high school in part because she got me up. Um, and I was not an easy person to get up. I wouldn't scream and yell. I'd just go no, back to bed. you just go back yeah. to bed. Jordan would get up. He yeah. Wouldn't. And mm -hmm. they had a, a paper route as yeah. well. And it was an evening paper route, but on the weekend it was early morning. And that was pretty hard. Because that was, you'd yeah. gotten up all week for school and then you had to get up for the paper route. Yeah. Yeah. So that was not so fun. Uh, the next question is, um, they want to know what your proudest moment of Brandon's is. Or when you were most proud of Brandon. Oh. Wow. Oh, no answer. Of, Let's move on. I've just always been proud of Brandon. Um, I just think the kind of father he is. I mean, I'm proud of his work. I, I think he's extremely talented. I think he's extremely dedicated. Um, you know, he when he decides to do something, he does it. But he's a great father and a great person. And I think that's the most important thing. You had and, a, and a great husband. Very nice moment when I was fur when I showed you my first check. Yes. That was a pretty big moment because you um, had been legitimately very worried about me. Um, I talked about this in my. If you go back, guys, go back and watch the um, keynote I did uh, for the the teen uh, book festival. I talked about this, but you were very worried. Yeah. Um, and when I was able to say, "Here is a check I earned." Um, that that's, was, that was, that was an important well, moment. And when, when you called me and told me you were finishing the wheel of time, yep. I mean, that was like, you'd I, bought me a lot of those books when I was a kid. It was one of your favorite series. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think mm -hmm. also when you, when you, on your wedding day. Yeah. When you finally got one of us married off. Well, no, on yeah. your wedding day, you gave me the first copy oh, of yes. the Oh yes. Of, it it was Mistborn, wasn't it? No, it was a launcher. Oh, the first copy I gave it. Yeah, that's right. Or was yeah. it Mistborn? Well, Mistborn had just we got just gotten copies. I guess it was. Yeah, yeah it was Mistborn. It was Mistborn. Yeah. Um, and and that was that was. Yeah, because right. Dan Wells has number one of Elantris, and yeah. you have number one of Mistborn, uh, and he has number two of Elantris. And or of Miss of Miss Born. Yeah. I've had to hide it because Wynn likes to give books to everybody. Yeah. And gotta and, look over this way. Oh, yeah. He, ha he has, likes to give books to everybody, and so I have him in this bookcase that my brother made for me, mm -hmm. and uh, Don't I'll take find those. him missing. So yeah. I, I, when I realized what he does, I had to go hide some of those so he didn't give away the <laughs> ones That'd that be are a shame. signed mm. to me. I've always said the secret to my success um, is that I am an artist who was trained in life by an accountant. Um, that the reason I am successful is because I have uh, an, um, an artist imagination, um, but I have the skill and background of an accountant. And my mom's an accountant, for those who don't know. Um, and I was able to say, here's this thing I want to do. How would my mother do this if she wanted to do it, right? How do you actually make your dreams come true? And I was able to be methodical about it uh, kind of reining in the artistic temperament that I pretty naturally have. Um, I think that without uh, good training as a young man, I would have uh, I would have been very much one of these head in the clouds uh, types. I would have been very much like uh, grand my grandmother Mary Beth, um, who was a wonderful woman, um, but uh, you know sometimes a little a uh, little scatterbrained at getting things done. Mm -hmm. um, I would have been like that, uh, but I had instead the good fortune to be an artist who is trained by someone who knows how to get things done. 
<laughs> but you also probably got a lot of your artistic talent from her. Because yes. She was very artistic. If we point to and somebody, I don't have any um, ability. You claim that. I don't. Um, but if, if if there is someone that I got it from, it's from Mary Beth. Yeah. Uh, she's the one that uh, I bonded with over fantasy novels once I discovered them. Andre Norton was her favorite, um, and we would talk for hours about uh, fantasy books we had read and things like that. And she. Uh, English teacher um, and uh, liked to direct plays and just wonderful woman. Fact, Both my grandmothers were fantastic. Didn't you get your idea to write Alcatraz from her? Not Alcatraz, yeah. but just to write a, yeah. a youth book. Yes, she was the one that was pushing me to do a juvenile. Because mm -hmm. um, that's the age she taught yep. in school. Uh, so, so, yeah. Um, and my, my other grandmother, mom's mom, uh, was like your quintessential pioneer woman in a uh, a modern uh setting like you went out and you would like your dad was lumberjack yes you would go in the summers and go live in a place without like electricity right yeah. and running water no running water out in the forest like little house on the prairie except in a forest in the tetons mm -hmm. and just my lumber grand, uh, yeah. my grandpa had a sawmill up there so mm -hmm. yes we lived up in the, in the forest that's Stoddard that Mill right mm -hmm. yeah Stoddard for any, any of you who know the the area around um, Island, Island Park. Park there the the mill there was there's still yeah. a up there there is a uh, fishing pond called Stoddard's fishing pond and that's where my grandpa's mill pond was but now they've made it a place for children to fish and I don't know how many you know pioneer women there were in like the 50s but there but grandma was one of those who yes. like you can imagine her carrying a hand you know she wouldn't push the hand she'd put it on her back and walk <laughs> across the plains with this thing on her back all the way while fixing pies for everyone and um the the funniest thing about her is you could not have dirty dishes in her house no they 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 you like and i like cups of water that i let you know have get cold by putting ice water and letting the ice sit i just like it really cold and i would put it down turn around and come back and it had been washed dumped out washed and put in the cupboard yeah uh in like in like 10 seconds all the time and we call that today you grandma called it yep because yep. if if anybody jane sometimes does that she's very oh not yeah. sometimes it's <laughs> it's yeah. a perpetual state so of say, oh you grandma called my glass yep that's <laughs> That those are those are the two forces that combined in me was you know very pragmatic pioneer stock and head in the clouds I want to direct melodramas and read fantasy novels um, and two opposites two come together and uh, you get Brandon and you know what's really interesting is is Lauren's a combination yeah of the two of them mm -hmm. Lauren very much is uh, that's why we're the two weird ones she's the weirdest though um, you know you can imagine how Combining different pieces of people might, in one end, end up with someone who looks like a person and someone who has, you know, three feet sticking out of their head. That's what Lauren is. <laughs> You're in real trouble now. <laughs> she, she's, yeah. <laughs> she could also be the honoriest. <laughs> mm, mm. She saw Lord of the Rings how many times, Lauren? Oh, 23, I think. Or, yeah. No, I think it was over 20. It could have been. Yeah. She even... She saved school. all of, yeah, and she saved all of her tickets. In, She's still bitter that Jane beats her at Trivial yeah, Pursuit, Lord, Lord of the Rings, Rings and Jane, I don't think, had seen them. She had not no. seen them, but she's good at guessing. She's good at guessing. <laughs> she's good at school and yeah. multiple choice questions. Anyway, we're off topic talking about family stuff. Give us another question, Adam. So, this one's from Betsy Klopchik, and they say, a question for Sandra Mom. So, you have a name. Mm. Um, which character of Brandon's do you think is most like you? Oh, You've never been asked that. I've never been asked that. Uh, I could tell you that Alcatraz is most like Brandon when he was young. That's why I love that book. Mm. Who's most like you? Mm. I don't know. I'm not artistic like Shalon. I'd like to be Shalon. But um, no, I, I would guess that um, Navani is a combination of you and Emily. And Navani is very like you. Very pragmatic, very, yeah. um, I'm gonna see things get done um, and stuff like that. So there, there's there's probably a bit of you and Navani. And Navani, yeah. Um, I would yeah. say for sure. Yeah. But you know, um, anytime a, an accountant shows up in my books, 
Uh, you can guess where that came from. Um, so uh, anyone who there people have pointed out there are a suspicious number of accountants in my books. Um, yeah. Some people are saying that she's the Lord Ruler. The Lord Ruler. <laughs> yeah, Lord Ruler. <laughs> <laughs> that probably works too. <laughs> um, um, this one is from um, Avinash Tawari. Um, they say hello, ma'am. Uh, which one is your favorite of Brandon's novels, and um, who is your favorite writer taking Brandon out of the mix? Out of the mix. I can guess what that is. Yeah. I know exactly who that is. That's Victor Hugo. You you got it. That's but, but he's Victor, also one of your he's favorites. He's also too. my favorite classic writer. Yeah, I, we share a love of Hugo's writing. And that's probably one of the plays that I've seen yeah. about mm-hmm. as many times as Lauren saw. If you were going to read fiction that wasn't one of mine, you'd read a historical epic. I would. Yeah. I would. Uh, and what was the other part of the question? Uh, which of Brandon's books is your favorite? You know, I thought about that. It's usually the one I'm reading. <laughs> so I love them all. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I have read and read and read out the press because it is Brandon when he was a young boy. The personality was Brandon. And, uh, you know, like the fish sticks under the bed or the crap pot nasty and things like that. That was Brandon. And so I love those. And I think another one... That that you know we don't talk about as much as, as uh, the Emperor's Soul. I love that. I love that book because Brandon went to Korea. It was uh, Taiwan. Ta- I went to Korea on my mission, yeah. but Taiwan's where that was. Inspired. Well, yeah. It, yeah, but you brought us back. Oh, those stamps. yeah, Tojongs. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. when you when you came home from Korea, and then you saw those again when you went over in Taiwan, and then it reminded you. And that inspired the magic. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm gonna let you come grab these, Kara. Okay. We're going to try and stay six feet away by going back like this. We'll let you do those and then replace it. Um, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I do think his best work is probably the Stormlight series. Yeah, I, you really get into those. My problem is, is I have a poor memory and there's so many characters that every time he writes a new book, I have to read all the ones before that so I can remember Oh, that's the fun part, though. It is fun. My books are the only fantasy novels you've read, right? They are, yeah. other than, oh, no. Oh. When, when you were young, you wrote book reports, and I had to Oh, you had to read the books. I had to the read them so that I could right. you your book reports. They're... Also because I would cheat on them sometimes when I was <laughs> yeah. a kid. Yes. Uh, the, a related question is, people want to know if you remember the first story Brandon brought to you. You know, uh, I, I was thinking about that after I watched the interview with Lynn. And Brandon, uh, when he was in high school, I would read his, his high school papers. He didn't bring his, his novels and things to me, but he took an AP class from a teacher that was <laughs> a teacher that was uh, from the University of Nebraska. And I always went to parent-teacher conferences. And the first parent-teacher conference, she says, I just don't know why he's in this class. He's just all over the place. Well, Brandon buckled down, you know, and and honed his skills, and he gave me a, a, something to prove that he'd written about a king. It was uh, it was Thomas a Becket and Richard II. It was. Um, they wanted me to write a report on it. Instead, I wrote uh, a historic fiction about yeah. the story I'd read My in first encyclopedia. Person, yeah. Back. It was the most the incredible assassination of I'd Thomas a Becket. Yeah. And I was just blown away. And then. Uh, I went to the last parent-teacher conference, which we only had two a year. He, uh, she said, I cannot believe that this is the best writer I've ever had. Same teacher. I, uh, I, that, that paper I turned in for two assignments because <laughs> being smart, so um, uh, and it failed the history assignment. <laughs> um, the, the writing professor liked it. The history professor was like, nope, this doesn't count as an essay. He gave me enough and made me write a new one. <laughs> so. I didn't know that. You yeah. just told me that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I did another paper. I, did, like, I just wrote it like an essay uh-huh. of the same stuff and turned it in and got a grade on it. But yeah, he, he would not take that. Um, as uh, I tried that twice in his class. Um, <laughs> And uh, he didn't let me get away with it, but I was honing those skills because freshman year at BYU, um, uh, two years later, I, I had an honors English class, and they let me get away with it. Every one of my essays was a story, 
Um, they're like, write an essay about, what did I have to write about? Like race relations or something like that. So I wrote a hard-boiled detective story about a PI investigating. Um, and that teacher was just like tickled. Now, having taught freshman composition myself, getting anything that is not yet another boring five-point essay um, is just so delightful that uh, I could see what that teacher was doing, but they let me get away with it, and I just kept doing that all through college. I did not write a lot of essays. I wrote a whole bunch of short stories that I called essays. Uh, we still got a bunch of them. Uh -huh. Yeah. <coughs> and it wasn't at the end of that, that year that you won the state. Um, so right? that was the next year. So the, it was when I was in the guy. Um, there, I had two AP classes. One was language, one was literature. Okay. Um, and I can't remember which is which, but one was the, the woman who was the professor, and one was a guy who loved Scrabble. And okay. uh, what else did he love? He loved, uh, he loved, um, he played uh, Scrabble, and there was some singer that he loved that he always played in class. But anyway, he's the one that gave me that, and I went and won the the. the and that was contest. also, a, you know, a really good. He, yeah, both of those teachers were great teachers. Yeah. Um, they were, they were... Yeah, I had some really good teachers through did, my high and, school career. And I, I think the, the key here, though, is, is you were able to take their advice and you would start one place and end up another. Yeah, I, I didn't always do what they wanted, but uh, I, I, I established a tradition of kind of ignoring my professors. Well, ignoring is the wrong term. I would listen and learn the things that they were teaching, but I would apply them in ways that they were not anticipating. How about that? Yes. Mm-hmm. So this next question comes from Adam Stormblessed. Ooh, they say, name. Goober, can you recount your experience with Brandon scaring you with a snake when he was young? <laughs> Uh-oh. Oh, how do I, what do I say? Dad might be watching, so. <laughs> well, um, I don't remember it quite that way. He went camping with his cousin. I, I really hate snakes. I, I hate snakes to death. So if anybody chases me with a snake, I... Yeah, I said you're I, like Indiana Jones and snakes. Like, I, it's, I, it's a serious it's thing. It's a serious yeah. thing. When, when Brandon mentioned that we lived up in the, the mountains in the summer, we lived at my grandpa's sawmill some of the time, and I had a lot of boy cousins, and they used to chase me with snakes, sometimes rattlesnakes, and try to put them down our necks. And so I think that's part of the reason I don't like snakes, is that I just have this huge fear from mm -hmm. when I was a child. But the one, the snake story that I remember is Brandon and uh, his dad and Grand, uh, Brandon's Graham? uncle, and no, it was um, Kevin. Oh, it was KC? Kevin and KC yeah. mm -hmm. uh, went camping just at a state park somewhere in Nebraska, and Brandon found a dead snake, and I brought the snake skin home, I think. I don't think it was the dead snake. I, think it was I totally could have brought the dead snake. I don't it's remember. It's possible. But he, but he chased me with it. I have and little boys now. I know what they do. Yeah. So. He thought it was so funny. And I and so that's the snake story I remember. The other one I remember is... is uh, when we used to have show and tell, and Brandon went to a school. He had, I think last week he mentioned Jakey, his little yep. partner. Yep, Jacob Youngblood. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they would, we would carpool them to grade school, and it was a ways away. There wasn't a school bus, and so um, one day I... Jakey jumps in, he's got this bucket without a lid on it. And I said, Jakey, what's in? What's for show and tell? And he picks up this snake and hangs it over me as I'm driving and says, a snake, and I just, we're really lucky that everybody lived. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was... Do you yeah. remember when I started a detective agency in third grade? Detective I agency. was reading, so for those who don't know like my history, I, in second and third grade, I really loved a book series called The Three Investigators. And then I fell out of love of reading and discovered again uh, with, grade. in eighth grade, Mrs. Reader. Um, Ms. Reader. Um, but um, I loved those books so much, I just started a detective agency with me and uh, Daniel Burchinko. Oh, I think I do. Um, and we got little, yeah. little cards printed up. But we could not find any mysteries to solve. <laughs> we were really irate that no one got shot <laughs> there were no mysterious um, vanishings. There were no like talking shadows or anything like in the books. Um, we, we were so mad. We had business cards, all yeah. three of us. I can't remember the other kid's name, but the three of us had business cards and we were waiting to hand them out to solve their mysteries. 
Nothing. No, nothing. Nothing happened. It was. It was. It was really a disappointing part of my life that we. My my first uh, enterprise um, in creating a detective agency did not go anywhere. You know that kind of takes us to our next question. Mm. Uh, what is the weirdest phase Brandon went through when he was young? Brandon always wore a great big fedora hat. I did do. I did have a fedora. This was before it was lame to wear fedoras. It was still lame, but it wasn't lame in the way it became lame. <laughs> well, he was he was in the school's jazz band, so yes. they each kind of had their own identity. And Brandon's mm -hmm. was the, the hat. And uh, the, loud suspenders. Yeah, loud, loud suspenders. suspenders. Um, and then like the hat would match the suspenders, yes. and then usually a necktie that that was loud also. This yeah. was the '90s, guys. Yeah, loud was in. I was, it was totally lame. It, you would, I would look at it and cringe. But, you know, I was in a jazz band. I had a hat and I had a suspenders and I had a tie. Uh, you, I had these ones you hated because they were bright orange and yellow. Yes. Yeah. You hated them. And she hated the hat because she knew how lame it looked. <laughs> uh, when I went to college, she sat on the hat. I did. <laughs> yep. I did. Yep. She sat on the hat and said, uh, she said, are you going to take this? I'm like, ah, probably not. I don't know if <laughs> I... And now. so she sat on it. It was great. <laughs> she sat on my hat. So um, another question kind of related to last week. Um, Evgeny says, Brandon says he used to hide his writing behind paintings on the wall. Did you secretly know about this and just let him have his fun? I didn't. I didn't know about it in high school. I, I was uh, more involved when he got in college because... He, um, if when you sent things in and they yep. were sent back, they'd come. They come back address. to you, so you would send on the rejection letters for me. Yeah. Yes. I did not get anything accepted, so they were always rejection. So letters, I was but. always telling you, Brandon, it'll be a nice hobby, mm -hmm. <laughs> but get your doctorate if you're going, and so that you can teach at the yes. university. After after the after you gave up on me becoming a chemist yeah, right, uh, or a right, doctor, right. then you're like, all right, he can be, become a professor. Um, what you didn't know is that I couldn't really become a professor. Um, this is something that, uh, that, that I didn't even really know until I went to grad school, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to become a professor um, is a lot of work, right? I have a lot of respect for people who actually manage to do it because there is a ton of work involved. And the work that it would require to become a, a professor to get a, you know, a tenure track position and stuff was would not have let me write books. Mm -hmm. um, I would have had to been doing research with professors to become a literature professor and spending all of my time on journals and things like that. Or um, if I wanted to become a, um, a writing professor, I would have needed to get into one of the top programs in writing who don't accept fantasy writers. They all rejected me. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I had no teaching opportunities realistically because I couldn't spend the time to get the literature side because I needed to be writing books. I, had to be, I was writing 40 hours a week on top of going to school and going having a job, right? Um, and I couldn't get into uh, the U or Iowa or Columbia or um, uh, UC Irvine. I could apply to all you know the mm -hmm. programs that you, because there are a lot of people who get degrees in creative writing, MFAs or PhDs in creative writing, um, way more than there are jobs. The, basically, the only ways you get jobs is by publishing or by going to a really prestigious school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I published, I wouldn't need to become a professor. Right. Um, so yeah, it was looking really dire there for a while. Um, and I don't think you knew how dire it was looking because you're like, he's in grad school, he'll become a writing professor. And I went to grad school kind of thinking that as well. And then I learned there was no way I was going to be able to become a writing professor. Um, just not a chance um, with the way I was going or become a literature professor. And so uh, I'm lucky that the writing took off. <clears throat> uh, I honestly don't know where I, right? Like I had, I had no marketable skills other than writing. Oh, yes, um, you So, yeah. So I, I learned my lesson. I don't tell people, well do that as a hobby now I say you can do anything you put your, your mind to <laughs> and I learned the lesson that you need to um, have a backup plan <laughs> I was going to say you need to watch his y'all west thing because yeah. he talks about that yeah oh. <laughs> as I've gotten older the more I've agreed with you <laughs> um, that a backup plan is a really good idea um, being a writer 
determining what job you might do that will leave you emotionally and mentally capable of writing. Because a lot of jobs, it's really hard to write while doing it. Um, I often use computer programming as the example because it uses the same parts of your brain. So you get home from computer programming exhausted from doing writing all day because you're writing code. Mm -hmm. And then it's hard to write. To write. Uh, and so having a backup plan that's either I'm going to become a coder because the same skill set works for coding. And then if the writing doesn't take off, I can use that same skill. So in that way, being learning code is really good for a writer. But there's also the argument of maybe you could find something that works your body and not your mind so yeah. that you're writing. So it's, it's a tough choice, but uh, I learned, yeah, learned a lot from that. And you were more right than you think um, that you were. It's nice to hear you say mm -hmm. that. <laughs> so this next one is from Argus Strav. Uh, and they say, when did you realize Brandon was becoming a big deal? And do you still want him to become a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want him to become a doctor. I think he's just great the way he is. And I, I think that when I first knew uh, that he was going to make it is, is when he finished the little time. I think that was the big deal. That yeah. year, things changed a lot. Yeah. They did, yeah. and I couldn't tell anybody. It was mm -hmm. something you couldn't tell, and it was just yep. that really was was when I knew. Yeah, you uh, you gave up on me becoming a doctor pretty early. Like oh. after my freshman year, we all knew, and you weren't pushing me to be a doctor. You just wanted you you had me major in chemistry because mm -hmm. it was good for getting scholarships, and she was right. I got scholarships, and I did like chemistry a lot in school. I always have liked the sciences. You can see that in my books. And it gave her a shot at a doctor. Um, and after my freshman year, um, we all knew, she knew. She didn't push me after that. When I said I'm changing English, it was not a, how dare you disappoint the family? It was a, okay, uh, I, I tried. Yeah, become a professor. <laughs> become a professor. That's a good place for Brandon. And that's what I thought I was going to be until I got into that grad program and I realized. Um, and so that was a hard year. Um, that first year when I realized I couldn't, um, because my second year into the program, I sold a book. Um, mm -hmm. you want to see a whole bunch of intimidated professors have one of your writing students get a book deal in the middle of their, um, yeah, <laughs> the, that's, uh, doesn't happen at most programs very often. I'm sure it happens a lot at, like Columbia and things, but at BYU was not very common. It happened to two of us though. Ali Kondi got one too, so. Um, well, it's nice that you mm -hmm. still teach a class. Yeah. Teach oh, I love the class. One, one a year. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a great thing to do. Because I, I always enjoyed my professors that had actually worked in the field. Uh, they just made a lot more sense. My best professor was the one who was a professional writer. Uh, my most useful. Not my best. Mm -hmm. Some of them are really good. But the most useful one was when Dave mm -hmm. came in and talked. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, they want to know if you can remember the weirdest story you remember Brandon telling you. Maybe What's one that stood story? out. Do I? Do we have a weird story? Um, well, he he borrowed his dad's um, Mercedes. It was a little sports car, Mercedes, and there are great big, huge dips around your school, and and he went through one and tore the oil pan out and didn't even know it. I mean, seriously, it wasn't a story he told me. It's when we said, what did you do? And he said, what? He didn't know. I was on a date. Yeah. And we told, I think Dad told that story too. I've not lived that one down. The Mercedes was a classic car. It was, uh, it was from 20 years before then. It was like mm -hmm. from the 60s or 70s. And it was one of Dad's pride and joys was this little, cute, um, classic car. Uh, Mercedes. Um, and it had a hard top. You could it had a hard top. top and take, yeah. Or take it mm -hmm. off and make it a convertible. And so, ripping out the oil pan on that. Uh, yeah. Well, it wasn't the fact that he ripped up the oil pan. It's that I had. Pan I, used, that he didn't know he'd done it. He didn't know I'd done it. Yeah. <laughs> that happened to me a lot. One of my nicknames in high school, you you guys called me, was Brain Dead. Yeah. yeah. Um, because um. I very much, I have this artist temperament, right? Mm -hmm. And so I've talked about before, I stuff my brain with stories. And, um, you know, I'm one of these people that um, I have learned 
how to put things above and below the fold is what I call. Like there are certain things that demand my attention. I'm very good at triage, time triage, and not paying attention to the things that don't. When I was in school, I was not as good at that, right? And the things that I would not get to, the things I would forget, often were things that deserve to be up here. Um, and so you, I could be a very dependable person in a lot of ways. Like you could trust that I was, like they never, like I didn't have a curfew or things no, like that, and right? You, and you were always really honest, yeah, so and I never really had any stories You never kind of stories like really that. worried about me doing my schoolwork or stuff, yeah. but what you did worry about is that I would forget that I had schoolwork, right? Yes. And that's different, right? Or that I would forget that there was this thing I, was, I had promised to do. Or, um, or call me from school and say, Mom, yeah. the paper I need to turn in yeah. is, is in my <laughs> computer. Will you print it? Yeah, I did that yeah, a I did lot. That. Oh, um, wow. And that I would, yeah. Uh, Mom, I forgot that there's a band trip today. Yeah. I need clothes. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to be gone all weekend yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Like, oh, uh, um, yeah. 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 The, other, the other thing that's maybe a little off track, but mm -hmm. he, he was always in another world and so he uh, was really messy and if he I mean his room was a disaster and so I would say will you clean up your room and he'd say sure you know I was always happy to do it and I'd come up and he said I'm done and there would be just trash everywhere all over the floor and I said Brandon what about this and he says what what and he wouldn't have even seen it I mean it's just not even there <laughs> yeah yeah and so I got to the point that when I wanted him to clean his room, I just picked everything up that was somewhere where it should be, put it in a great big pile, and I said, when that pile's gone, you're through. So, <laughs> he just, was, yep. just didn't see certain things. But he uh, we, we, my friends use the term lost in his own museum. Uh, it comes from Indiana Jones and the uh, uh, Last Crusade, but they would say, he gets lost in his own museum. Yeah. Um, and I've gotten, like, as an adult, I don't really do that anymore. Um, but that was one of the things I had to learn that was kind of hard was how to manage my time and how to focus on the things I needed to focus on and things like that. Yeah. And they had, they would have friends over every Friday night to play games. Role play. Pizza. Yep. I was DM. We had pizza and, uh, we would, uh, we would do our big role playing sessions. Uh, a lot of... A lot, this is a story about Goober. A lot of the parents, this is the 80s and 90s when the weird thing that D&D is a cult happened, right? Um, and this might sound very weird to some of you listening, but it moved through society. It was one of these things that D&D is secretly a satanic whatever. Um, and it was like this weird kind of witch panic thing. Um, and so mom heard this and she's like, huh. And so <laughs> she came while we were role playing and went and listened to us and like took one of the books and read it, yeah. right? And then um, I remember I was, I, I don't know, I heard this, I was listening, you were talking to someone, someone had said, said to you, and I, they did, you guys didn't know I was even listening. They're like, she's like, how do you let them play that game? And you were like, they sit and are social and talk to each other and problem solve instead of sitting on video games? I love it, it's great. <laughs> there was even a girl at one of them once. Um, and. I've always thought it was to your credit that instead of just believing all the hype, you like got one of the books, you read it, you listened in on what we were doing. You're like, oh, this is fine. fine. This yeah. is fine. They're sitting around and telling stories about being orcs and slaying zombies. Well, like, you're using yeah. your brain. Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's an important thing. Yeah, you always encouraged it because <laughs> you knew that if we weren't doing that, we would probably have been playing video games, which mm -hmm. nothing wrong with video games. If all of your time is video games, you're not interacting. And we would interact, and there was even a girl who came. Yes. Uh, which, you know, getting your nerdy little, uh, little um, sons uh, to actually interact with, uh, with women was, uh, was not easy. Uh, Brandon, um, someone is hoping that you can wish Nick Gurr a happy birthday. Nick Gurr? Hey, Nick, this is Brandon. Happy birthday to you. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day. I'm sorry that you have to do it in quarantine. Um, birthdays are probably not as fun. Um, like many things aren't as fun, but at least you get a thumbs up for me. Keep going. Um, and this next one for Goober. Um, which character of Brandon's would you most like to meet? <laughs> I would like to meet Dallin. There you go. At what age? <laughs> <laughs> 
I think every rational human being is going to say old Dalinar, not young Dalinar. Yes. Uh, let's see. Oh, and many people are wondering what you played in jazz band. Um, I played trumpet. Um, so I, uh, I picked up trumpet in fourth grade, I think. And I did it all the way through my freshman year of college. Um, so. They even had a scholarship to BYU. Yeah, they gave me a few hundred bucks for, for my trumpet because I was in the, the band, uh, the marching band. And you went to a bowl game. We in did. Tucson. We okay. did. Um, so uh, band was a really good thing for me, mm -hmm. I feel, when I was in high school. It's a nice uh, different sort of social group than my D&D &D friends and things like that. And... Uh, was just really good. I have not kept it up. Um, I realized somewhere sophomore year, um, it might have been freshman year. It was actually freshman year. Freshman year, I realized that I could not both have music and writing. Right? They like. I'm sure there are people out there who can do them, but I couldn't. I had to have one passion and one hobby that I was looking to turn into a profession. And I had always done music as a fun thing, but I was not a musician. Right? Um, he, was a, he, he was good, but wasn't his passion. Right, and I didn't like I didn't enjoy practice. It was always hard to get me to practice. Like I enjoyed being in the band, and I played well enough to do well in the band and get in the college band. But it was never something that I was like excited to do. Right. Right. Um, and so uh, that's when I um, I stopped doing the music, and I haven't really played uh, since. Which some people might think is tragic, but that's the point. Um, it in my career was so that I'd understand music, think it's good for everyone to understand music and how to read music and to have that social community. Right. And have that opportunity, that chance, right? Like in college where I'd be like, this is something that could become a lifelong passion and hobby for me. I have the found grounding in it. And it just wasn't for me. Tell them about me, uh, Emily being in the same band. Emily and I, so my wife Emily, we were in the band the same year. Uh, we worked at the library at BYU at the same time. Uh, we had a lot of the same classes, just different years from each other. We never know that we met. Um, yeah. So it's one of those things. And that birthday message was a very tasteless attempt to get you to say a racial slur. Oh, really? So I think you didn't. Okay. But Ian, I'm very disappointed in you for trying mm -hmm. to, to do that. So um, anyway, another question for Goober. Um, what book of Brandon's would you give to your mother to read first? Oh, my mother um, read mm -hmm. all of them. She mm. did. She read all of them. She was um, a reader. She, she liked books. She loved books. Mm -hmm. And um, she read them. She passed away before the Stormlight series came out. Uh, but she did read Miss Bourne. So she went up through those. Uh, I would probably I would, I would probably give her Way of Kings. She mm. loved yeah, and she, she, she and a lot of what she read was historical. Uh, she was. read a ton and of big, thick historical books. She did, and and she liked the strong characters. Mm -hmm. and, and she'd read biographies too. Mm -hmm. She liked a lot of biographies. Mm -hmm. So, um, what nicknames did Brandon have when he was a kid, other than Brain Dead? Brain Dead. Um, Oh, what what did we call you when you were little? Beat up. Beat up. Yep. Yep. He ran he ran around in little overalls, and his name was Brandon Wynn Sanderson, and so it was B W, and we just mm -hmm. ended up calling him B Dub. Yep. And we're at eight o'clock. We're so at eight o'clock. All right, I'm gonna finish this little little pile. Do you want to give one more question? Um, let's see. Um, what is the weirdest situation Brandon ended up as a little a little kid? Weirdest situation. Let's see. It's a little kid. Well, the, as a little kid, probably the weirdest one when I already told. Yeah, when I made concrete in the, yeah. the kiddie pool. Well, what was happening at that time is, is we had a man over there uh, taking the bricks and making um, uh, flower beds. Mm -hmm. And he was working and didn't realize that Jakey and Brandon were stealing the cement. And they just kept pouring it in the pool. And by the time we figured out what they'd done, it had hardened. And the towels were stuck in it. We couldn't get the towels out, and we had to go dump it in a vacant lot because it was a solid size of a swimming pool piece of cement. With the with the uh, with the shovels in it too. Yeah, we ruined the shovels. You're, you're really lucky you didn't get stuck in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you guys for watching. Thanks, mom, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for um, We probably will do this in two weeks. Probably we'll do these every two weeks, depending on when things come in. Uh, you guys have a good night.